morning and welcome to Men in Church. Our first reading is from the book of Exodus, chapter 1, verse 8, through chapter 2, verse 10. Now a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. He said to his people, Look, the Israelite people are more numerous and more powerful than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, or they will increase, and in the event of war, join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore they set taskmasters over them to oppress them with forced labor. They built supply cities, Pithom and Ramses, for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread so that the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites. The Egyptians became ruthless in imposing tasks on the Israelites and made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and in every kind of field labor. They were ruthless in all the tasks that they imposed on them. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shifra, and the other Pua. When you act as midwives to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a boy, kill him, but if it is a girl, she shall live. But the midwives feared God, and they did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but they let the boys live. So the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this? and allowed the boys to live. The midwives said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. So God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and became very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, Every boy that is born to the Hebrews you shall throw into the Nile, but you shall let every girl live. Now a man from the house of Levi went and married a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was a fine baby, she hid him for three months. When she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and plastered it with bitumen and pitch. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds on the banks of the river. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. The daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river while her attendants walked beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her maid to bring it. When she opened it, she saw the child. He was crying, and she took pity on him. This must be one of the Hebrews' children, she said. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go to get you a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Yes. So the girl went and called the child's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child and nurse it for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed it. When the child grew up, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and she took him as her son. She named him Moses, because she said, I drew him out of the water. From Psalm 46, verses 1 through 5. God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. Salah! There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her, she will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Let us pray. Most holy God, from the comfort of our homes we gather to worship. 
We come to you because we want to connect with the divine who is in, within us and who is the source of all light and life in the world. We come to you because we trust in God who gives us inner peace in the midst of the turmoil of the world. In this worship, help us become fully immersed in the grace of the Lord because we acknowledge that where the grace of God is missed, bitterness is born. We know that God gives grace to the humble and opposes the proud. So make us humble in your presence and let us receive your unbounded grace so that we will be able to give grace to others. Lord, you own everything and control everything in our lives. Your hand allows each mind to think and teaches each heart to beat for you. We confess that we are yours, touched by your salvation, and made by you for your glory. As we lift up your name and listen to your word, make us new again and mold us into the likeness of Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Of David. 
If it had not been the Lord who was on our side, let Israel now say, If it had not been the Lord who was on our side, when our enemies attacked us, then they would have swallowed us up alive when their anger was kindled against us. Then the flood would have swept us away, the torrent would have gone over us, then over us would have gone the raging waters. Blessed be the Lord, who has not given us as prey to their teeth. We have escaped like a bird from the snare of the fowlers. The snare is broken, and we have escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. Let us pray. Gracious God, you pour out freely the gift of the Holy Spirit upon us. We are amazed at the wonders of your grace, filling the universe with symbols of love. We are God's children who know that the grace of God is revealed in so many different ways and so deeply in our lives. We are called to help make people understand the grace of God through our compassion and kindness. O oh Lord, we confess before you that we have failed so many times to recognize and reveal your grace to the people. We have been satisfied with ordinary things, but blind to spiritual things. We opened our ears to the strong, but ignored the cries of the vulnerable. We frequently turned a blind eye to sufferings, needs, and grief of the people. Forgive us our sins and turn us around to see all your children in the world. Help us set aside our distractions and receive the renewing touch of your hand. In the days to come, remind us of your love and grace that will raise us up to a life of joy. Show us your power to transform our hearts and minds every time we fall. We praise your faithfulness in seeing us through to the end of our journey. In the gracious name of Jesus Christ, Amen. i 
Good morning from my backyard. If you watch closely, you might get to see a hummingbird in the, over my shoulder. So I'm reading from Romans 12 verses one through eight. I appeal to you therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourselves more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body, we have many members and not all the members have the same function. So we who are many are one body in Christ and individually we are members one of another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, prophecy in proportion with faith, ministry in ministering, the teacher in teaching, the exhorter in exhortation, the giver in generosity, the leader in diligence, the compassionate in cheerfulness. Hi, good morning, Mendon Church family. Again, it was such a wonderful service last Sunday, and I was so delighted to see everyone who came. I made a couple of calls to uh, some of our church members that didn't show up either service in August, and I realized that they didn't have an, e have an email address, nor they heard anything about our in-person service. So if you know the people who have not come to our service so far, please call them to say that our in-person service takes place every first and third Sunday each month. If they decide not to come because of a concern about their safety, it is perfect, perfectly okay and understandable. They still can join us through our online worship. Today I am going to talk mostly about the first two chapters of Exodus. I decide to continue my sermon on Exodus because it continues the stories from Genesis. All of a sudden, a happy ending story of Genesis becomes a tragedy, and I would like to talk about the meanings of Christian life in the midst of all kinds of uncertainty and unrest of individual and communal life. But first of all, a joke is ready for you. A preacher went to visit an elderly woman from his church who just had an operation. As he was sitting there talking with her, he noticed a bowl of peanuts on the stand next to the chair on which he was sitting. He began to eat them, and soon it was time for him to leave. When he got up, he noticed that he had eaten all of her peanuts on the bowl. He said, Mary, I'm so sorry that I ate all of your peanuts. Then she replied, That's okay, Pastor. I already sucked all of the chocolate off, the, off of them. I know it is not a clean joke. I mean, it is a clean joke for the sake of making a joke. But it is not hygienically clean. If the world is a place where everyone can have his or her favorite portion, separately and fairly. Like Mary liked 
like chocolate and chocolate part and the pastor like the peanut part, then there would be no problem in the world. However, it is not the case in our real world. In reality, individuals, groups, communities, and nations are vying for a higher position and power. Sometimes competition takes place because of scarcity. When there are not enough resources or goods for all, competition is inevitable. In this case, power means to have the authority to determine who gets what, or to decide what criteria to be applied for the, distri distri dis for the distribution process. For example, we all are familiar with the economic, economic theory of supply and demand. When there is a limited supply, of a good and there is a high demand for the good, then competition occurs. In many cases, a mismatch between the supply-demand equilibrium causes the price to be increased. So who gets what is determined by who has more money to buy it, because money has determinative power. However, there is a different kind of competition that is not caused by scarcity. The purpose of this competition is the same, which is to get or to confirm one's power over others. But this, is, this competition is not because everybody scrambles for dwindling resources. It is more caused by psychological or ideological thoughts about truth and values. If, some, if someone or a group of people has this power to determine what counts as true or valuable, it gives them a sense of relevance in their social circle. Whether it is a small group focusing on a hobby, or it is a huge political party in the nation. A sense of rel relevance is important for most, of pe most people because it also offers a sense of belongingness to them. A sense of belongingness can be understood as a sense of acceptance, which is a human need, just like the need for food and shelter. People feel that they are valuable and important through the group they belong to, through the sense of belongingness and acceptance. Especially in an election season like, like these days, we can confirm that people tend to be more divided than normal, normal times because they are attached to their political parties more strongly. Again, a lot of times, it is more about their values, relevance in the society, and less about rational approaches to specific issues. If we read the passage from Exodus chapter 1, verse 8 through chapter 2, verse 10, we can find the background context of the book of Exodus. The first, ver first verse verse 8 of chapter 1, explains a lot of things. It reads, Then a new king, who did not know about Joseph, came to power in Egypt. Now Pharaoh does not know Joseph or, or recognize how Joseph helped save Egypt from famine. Many generations passed since Joseph but his story wasn't passed down through the generations. As we learned last Sunday, Joseph interpreted the, the weird dreams of Pharaoh and recommended him to uh, collect as much grain as possible during the seven years of abundant harvest 
to prepare the seven years of famine. Then the Pharaoh appointed Joseph the second most powerful ruler in Egypt, giving him a special name called Jephnath Paniah, which means the one who discovers hidden things. It was almost like, a, like a receiving Medal of Honor in the United States. The people of Egypt once depended on him, and he saved the entire nation with his wisdom and manifest management skills. His family settled in Goshen, which was called the best of the land, and lived there in peace and prosperity. His father Jacob lived there for 17 years and died. All his brothers made large families there. However, everything was changed when the new king became deeply concerned that the Israelites had grown far too numerous and far too strong. He just chose to ignore the history of Joseph and reframe the existence of the Israelites from the most favored, most favored immigrants to the most hate, hated aliens. In verse 10, he further made a false statement to stir up fear among the Egyptians by saying, there are too many already. What if a war breaks out and they will join our enemies in fighting against us and leave our country after destroying everything? Here. Do you understand what he was doing? Do you see why he began with a preemptive strike upon the Israelites and the illusory threat they might pose? That's right. The new pharaoh was creating a political strategy to solidify his power by singling out a relatively weak minority or outsider group and calling them an enemy. At the same time, it could be a powerful source of unity among the Egyptians. By singling out the rap rapidly expanding Hebrew minority as an emerging threat to the nation's security, he tried to uh, weaponize them for his political gain. Sounds it familiar? Fear-mongering. It is not new now, and it was not new then, either. Fear is such a powerful, pre-rational emotion for anyone. When people are surrounded by fear, it does not matter how strong evidence they have to support their feeling. No comprehensive evidence-based approach is possible because it is planned by the primary motivator to get others to accept his or her agenda from the beginning. Fear-mongering is such a powerful and effective political tool, not only back in the days, but also our current time. This was what the Pharaoh was doing against Jacob's descendants, I mean the Israelites. Then what did he do? He tried three different strategies to oppress the Israelites. First of all, he enslaved the people of Israel. He forced them into slave labor to build two, two of Pharaoh's supply cities which he designed to serve Egyptian economy in the distribution of goods. Something like the dis distribution center or the warehouse for the nation. Second, Pharaoh commanded midwives to kill every boy they delivered to Hebrew mothers. But he, spread the, he spared the lives of girls because 
he believed that they were not a potential threat to the nation. Third, Pharaoh commanded all Egyptians to throw Hebrew, Hebrew boys into the Nile River. This commandment was given to all Egyptians after he found the second strategy unsuccessful. So the families of newborn baby boys had to hide them, not only from, from Egyptian officials, but from all Egyptian people, because they might come to their houses and throw the boys into the Nile River. The goal of Pharaoh's strategies was to diminish and weaken the Israelites by making their lives bitter and harder. harder. However, God blessed them even more and they became bigger and bigger. God sustained them through, through the disobedience of midwives. God spared the life of Moses, who would lead the entire Israelites out of Egypt. No matter how severely Pharaoh oppressed God's people, God made a way for them every time. Ironically, all of God's plans to spare the Israelites and the baby boys came to realize through female figures. For example, the Israelites multiplied greatly even after the forced slavery status. The description of highest fertility implies in the Old Testament, especially in the book of Gen Genesis, that God opened the wombs of Israelite women. You can understand this concept through the stories of Sarah, Rebecca, Leah, Rachel in Genesis. The fact that they multiplied greatly implies that God kept them and blessed them in spite of their oppression. Another example that God works through women to break the chains of oppression of Pharaoh is the Hebrew midwives in Egypt. It is very interesting that the book of Exodus even introduces their names as Shifra and Pua because their decision to spare the lives of male babies came from their faith in God. They disobeyed Pharaoh's commandment and lied to him because they feared God more than they feared Pharaoh. They understand that their vocation from God was to preserve and protect babies, to preserve and protect life. This is the first case of civil disobedience and nonviolent resistance in the Bible. They explained to Pharaoh that the Hebrew women were like animals and gave birth too quickly before they arrived. In a sense, they used Pharaoh's prejudice against Israelite, Israel, Israelite women as a tool to save the lives of the baby boys. The last example of how God worked, worked through women is Miriam and Pharaoh's own daughter in saving the life of baby Moses. The princess was not serving God, but she saw the baby Moses and heard his cries and acknowledged his vulnerability. She just recognized his humanity and felt like she needed to act on it. She even listened to Miriam, Moses' sister, who said that the baby would need a nanny. So she hired Moses' own mother to take care of him. Interestingly enough, as we can see from the passage, Pharaoh did not consider women as a threat 
to his regime. regime. He allowed the Hebrew girls to leave. He didn't punish the midwives that gave him a false report. Ironically, God worked subtly and indirectly through, this, through the three women, Miriam, Pharaoh's daughter, and Moses' mother, to begin God's plan to save the Israelites out of Egypt. Folks, no matter how human authorities or people in power try to distort the truth and oppress God's people, God always makes ways to deliver them. God even used Pharaoh's own daughter for God's purpose, which implies that defiance of God, Pharaoh's command came from within his own house. God always raises people who embrace, embrace life, whether or not they understand God's plan, in order to defy the rulers and those in the top of the power structure, to deliver them from delivered people from the bondage of oppression. This is how God works through the people who uphold the value and dignity of human life. In the midst of all kinds of social and political unrest, in which unverified rumors and exaggerated claims abound, all of them aim to mislead public opinions and to weaken the social order and to diminish common decency in public discourses. But God works through the people. Even though they might be a small numbers, but God used them to uphold the value and love of human life. So Paul said in Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the patterns to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, His pleasing and perfect will. Many Christians don't know what to do with these verses. They feel like it sounds great, great message. And it seems to be uh, what Christians ought to do. But they don't know what these verses mean in their real life. What does it mean to offer our bodies as living sacrifices? Do we have to put ourselves on the pile of wood? and burn the wood and burn ourselves? What is the meaning of spiritual act of worship? Don't worry. Paul does not give this statement without specific instructions. He gives concrete examples of, of what it means to live our life as a living sacrifice in the, in the coming verses which can be summarized in two categories. First of all, a living sacrifice means to try to discern God's good, pleasing, and perfect will in, the, in every situation, not by the dominant opinion of the surrounding people, not by the social and political frames by the people in power, but by the will of God. We are urged to make our own choices. To live out faith on the basis of what God has done for humanity, which is the life, death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, is the meaning of how we live our life as a living sacrifice. Folks, don't consider 
We are the first generation to deal with fear and uncertainty of the world. Don't consider that we are the first case to hear about fear-mongering and de deception from the rulers. Please don't think that we are the first ones in history to feel a threat or to hear sugar-coated promises if we follow or not follow the direction of the rulers. Just like the midwives in the, in the story of Exodus chapter 1, just like Miriam and the princess, princess in chapter 2, God looks for the people of God who preserve and protect life and who uphold God-given human dignity than the social and political discourses of the society. Would you choose the way, ways to support ideas that unify and encourage people to help them live up to their God-given dignity? Or would you follow the voices of fear-mongering that exclude and divide people? Second, in the next verses, Paul also suggests that we should not think of ourselves more highly than we ought, but make decisions with sober judgment based on the measure of faith. It implies that we are called to live our life as a testimonial to who God is and what God has done for us. God calls us to become instruments of evangelism through the way through the ways we live our life. Especially in this political season, especially in this time of pandemic, we are called to live our life, to spread God's love and God's sacrifice for humanity through Jesus Christ. If people hear what we say and feel that we are driven by God's love, not by the spirit of fear or hatred or division. It proves that we live our life as a living sacrifice before God. We manifest, manifest that the source of our power in our life comes from God. Just like God used, used midwives, Miriam and Moses' mother to save life and to pave the way for God's saving grace. We are called to live our life as a living sacrifice, as a test, as a testimonial, as the ones who seek to build the kingdom of God in today's world. Be careful. The world, the world will fight at every stage to convince us to look the other way, apart from God's way. May God keep all of you always and make you a blessing for others. Amen. God of truth, we thank you for the hope that comes from you, the creator and ruler of the universe. In our spiritual battles, we often forget who is behind and with us. We are thankful that you hear our sighs and cries when no one else hears them. We thank you for making ways for us in the places where there seem to be no way. You make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Sometimes we are filled with despair and hopelessness because we don't see the light on the road ahead. Sometimes we struggle and fight without knowing where we're going. But you demand us to relax and breathe, as you said in Isaiah 46.10, Be still and know that I am God. You are the sovereign ruler, the mover of mountains, and the victor of impossible victories, and we are in your mighty hand. Have mercy on us when we do not feel witty or bright and feel like giving up. 
provide the grace, strength, and faith we need to take the next step toward our spiritual destination. Help us always find eternal peace and unspeakable joy in Jesus Christ in the midst of the storm, because you are always with us. We rely on your promise that there is no single moment that you forget us or leave us alone. We lift up our praises to the Lord, who always comes to the rescue us from our troubles. Hallelujah. Amen. Jesus loves me, Jesus loves me. 